Hi, this is Richard Santucci. I'm the Director of Human Rights for the Department of Developmental Services, and this is a training on human rights, what families need to know. We're going to be talking about the basic human rights for people served by the Department of Developmental Services, the limitations on those rights, how families can make a positive impact in solving human rights issues. We're going to be joined by Hillary Dunn from the Disability Law Center, by Susan Nadworny from Massachusetts Families Organizing from Change, and Kathy Carpenter from the department's Human Rights Advisory Committee. I'm Katherine Carpenter, a member of the Department of Developmental Services Human Rights Advisory Committee, often referred to by its initials as HRAC. I'd like to take a few minutes to share who we are, what we do, and then why and how you might use our work to support persons served by DDS whom you care about. The advisory committee has 15 members from various parts of Massachusetts. We meet monthly as a whole body, and then some of us meet additionally for work on special projects. Our main role and purpose is to assess, advise, and inform our DDS commissioner on how well the department is doing on affirming, promoting, monitoring and protecting the human rights of all individuals it serves. In so doing, as part of our work, we review and report on the human rights policies and regulations, support the work of our human rights office, consider current content for human rights trainings, assist local DDS human rights committees, and also work with various disability organizations focusing our attention on and responses to DDS human rights issues, especially those of particular interest to families. Family understanding of the DDS human rights system is so important, and yet our committee has uncovered significant gaps in family knowledge of these rights. I am an example of a parent who had these gaps. Despite training with various organizations and a general understanding of human rights, I knew so little about the DDS human rights system. And I had no idea such knowledge could make a positive difference for working with the department and its staffs to assure our daughter's rights were fully honored in her day and residential settings. HRAC has developed various resources to fill those gaps and to provide further information. This PowerPoint Plus videos is one of those resources. In addition, we recently completed a project that truly warms my parental heart, and it's available on our website. It's our Human Rights Resources for Families manual, and the cover looks like this. The contents contain valuable information that can help you cope effectively with questions, issues, or challenges you may well encounter in monitoring and protecting your loved one's rights. One last resource I'd like to share is our website's Rights Review Newsletter. It's designed for human rights committees, but it can be of value for all interested individuals and families. We issue it quarterly, featuring up-to-date news, advice, interesting stories, and helpful information. Hi, I'm Hillary Dunn of the Disability Law Center, and I'm going to talk to you briefly about the basic human rights for people served by the Department of Developmental Services. And when I'm done, I'll talk a bit more about the Disability Law Center. General principles, services provide humane and adequate care, services teach independence, promote social inclusion, and encourage self-determination. Quality of care. You should expect services for your family member to be provided with care and respect. They should be well taken care of, free from discomfort, distress, and deprivation. Staff should know about any special support needs and preferences of that person. Staff need to communicate to your family member calmly, respectfully, and in an age-appropriate manner. They need to be attentive to your family member. Choices are based on the individual's interests, not staff preferences or convenience. Personal care with dignity. Staff need to provide good and thorough personal care so that your family member is clean, comfortable, and properly dressed. 
Appearances do matter. People can have a reasonable expectation to get help with personal care from same-sex staff that involves disrobing. Helping people to become more independent. Services should teach functional and meaningful skills to people that they can use in their lives to become more independent. These should be geared to each person's needs, abilities, and interests. Independence. Services and supports need to be provided in the least restrictive way possible. Staff should provide only as much assistance as is needed. They should encourage the individual to do as much as they can so as to avoid learned helplessness. Restrictions must be as minimal as possible to ensure safety. Services promote belonging. People should be supported to dress and conduct themselves in the community in an age-appropriate way that will promote community membership. Taking charge. People are in charge of their own lives. They get to make important decisions about their lives. This includes opportunities to make choices about what to eat and drink, how to spend their leisure time, when to go to bed, and how to spend their money. Decisions and risks. People have a right to make decisions. Some of these decisions may not be what others think are best. It's important to educate and encourage people about the variety of choices that are available. Otherwise, they may just stick to what they already know. Families can be an important source of information. Sometimes the best way to learn is by making mistakes. We all do it. It is part of life unless the individual's safety and well-being are unreasonably jeopardized. Communication. People can communicate with others in whatever way they choose. People should receive the help that they need to communicate in the way that works best for them. To visit and be visited at home. People can have visitors and visit others. It is their home after all. Staff should be polite and courteous to the visitors. Visitors also should be considerate since there may be other people living there as well. Privacy. People have a reasonable expectation of privacy. This can include spending time alone, communicating with family and friends, or having private time with visitors. Possessions. People get to buy and keep their own things. They should have a place to safely keep their stuff. Possessions are not restricted unless they pose an immediate threat of serious physical harm to the individual or others. I'm Hillary Dunn. I'm an attorney at the Disability Law Center, or DLC. I serve on the DDS Statewide Human Rights Advisory Committee on behalf of DLC, and I also have a brother served by DDS. Now, DLC is a private, nonprofit organization responsible for providing protection and advocacy for the rights of Massachusetts residents with disabilities. We are not part of the state or federal government. We are not DDS, and we are not the Disabled Persons Protection Committee, or DPPC. And importantly, our services are free. Our mission is to provide legal advocacy on disability issues that promote the fundamental rights of all people with disabilities to participate fully and equally in the social and economic life of Massachusetts. We serve people with all types of disabilities throughout the entire Commonwealth with disability-related legal issues. We don't handle general legal issues, such as divorce or setting up a special needs trust. We serve people with disabilities whose legal problem falls within a DLC priority area, and DLC has the staff time and resources needed to resolve the issue. The demand for our services far exceeds our resources. As such, DLC has to adopt annual priorities based on input from people in the disability community. For a complete list of our priorities this fiscal year, please visit our website. DLC is the Protection and Advocacy Agency for Massachusetts. The Protection and Advocacy Agencies, or PNAs, are disability rights agencies investigating abuse and neglect and providing legal representation and other advocacy services. Every state must have a designated Protection and Advocacy Agency. Now, due to our resources, we really do need to focus the majority of these resources on our core functions, and I'm gonna list those four core functions. One is information referral and training. A second is monitoring. 
DLC monitors facilities where people with disabilities live or receive services to prevent, detect, and address instances of abuse, neglect, or exploitation. The intake process that we have, um, our individual case representation, and our work in other areas informs our monitoring work and where to monitor. Our third uh, function is conducting investigations. In situations where we believe serious abuse or neglect may have occurred, we may conduct an investigation. An investigation can stem from an individual concern and be more individually focused, but due to resource issues, we often focus on investigations where the outcome may be systemic change resulting in a better quality of care for a large group of people with disabilities. Our fourth and final function that we're going to discuss is advocacy, and this can include individual case representation and systemic advocacy that could include class action lawsuits or something like advocacy on policy issues. For more information, please see our website or to call or complete an intake, please call our main number at 617-723-8455. We're going to talk a little about limitations of rights, why they may be needed and how they would be used. Here are some important concepts. Least restrictive. Use the minimum limitation of individual freedom that will still ensure safety from unreasonable risk. Unreasonable risk. This will vary for each person in each situation. Use a team process to assess risk and consider alternatives. People have a right to experience reasonable risks. A reasonable risk. Eileen is a bit overweight and is trying to eat healthier foods. Her doctor recommended that she try to lose 25 pounds. She came home from a walk on Saturday with a box of donuts and started to eat them. Supporters remind her that the donuts are high in calories and will cause her to gain weight. They suggest healthier options instead. When Eileen has her weigh-in at the Weight Watchers meeting later that week, she finds that she has gained 3 pounds. Now here's an unreasonable risk. Janet has diabetes. She came home from a walk on Saturday with a box of donuts and started to eat them. The last time this happened, she went into a diabetic coma. Socialization risks. A reasonable risk. Barney lives in, the, in a community residence and can generally go into the community by himself for a few hours. On Friday night, he wants to go to a local bar for a karaoke night by himself. Supporters are afraid. They are just not sure what will happen. Perhaps the patrons at the bar will make fun of him or take advantage of him in some way. Bernie says he will only bring enough money to buy two beers and will carry his cell phone in case of an emergency. An unreasonable risk. Becky tells staff that her boyfriend is coming to pick her up at the house. When he arrives in his car, he's driving erratically, and when he comes to the dark, he smells of alcohol. Supporters don't want her to get into the car with him. The process for limitations. If we're going to impose limitations on someone's rights, there must be a compelling reason for this limitation. There must be an element of imminent risk, which is unreasonable to the person or to others. The proposed limitation must be the least restrictive method possible to reduce or eliminate the risk. The individual or guardian has given consent to the limitation. There has to be a teaching plan for the person so that they will be able to learn what they need to know in order to be free from the limitation. This includes a criteria to fade or end the restriction. The proposed limitation plan is reviewed by the ISP team and the Providers Human Rights Committee. A case example. A compelling reason. Julie wants to use the stove by herself to cook lunch. However, she has burned herself on three occasions, and last week she started a small grease fire in the kitchen. The proposed limitation. Julie can only use the stove with supervision. A least restrictive alternatives. Staff have explained how to use the stove and showed Julie how to cook some of her favorite items. However, she has continued to have cooking accidents. So we know that less restrictive alternatives have been tried. Consent. Julie and her guardian agree. A teaching plan. Staff will work with Julie every Saturday afternoon on cooking. They will use colored tape on the stove dial to indicate how high to turn up the burner. They will provide less support over time as Julie becomes more proficient. They will take progress notes on how much assistance she needs each time. The plan to fade. 
Well, after six months, the team, including Julie and her guardian, will reassess Julie's ability, review progress notes, and determine whether she is safe to cook independently. Hi, I'm Rich Santucci from the DDS Office for Human Rights. Our office serves to affirm, support, and protect the human rights of individuals who are served by the Department of Developmental Services. This entails making sure that the department and its providers provide services in a way that are sufficient to meet the needs of people, that are provided with respect and dignity, that teach people independence, and that promote self-determination and choice so that people can take charge of their own lives to the extent that they can. One of our roles is to offer interpretations of the regulations. We, are, we may be called upon by families or individuals who are concerned that their rights are not being properly respected. In these instances, we'll work with families and individuals, provide them support, training and education, and also work with providers and departmental staff to best understand the regulations and how they apply to each situation. We provide education and training both the individuals and families about what their rights are and how to support those rights and how to exercise those rights. And we work with provider and departmental staff about how to best support individuals in a way that will encourage and assist them to exercise their human rights. We also support providers in supporting them and their human rights systems. This involves attending human rights committee meetings that are held at the provider agencies and offering guidance and assistance to the provider staff who are responsible for overseeing those, the work of those committees. Our office is also charged with monitoring the use of emergency restraints in the provider community. Sometimes restraints are necessary when an individual is at risk of, of serious injury to themselves or others. In that instance, our office looks at each restraint, makes sure that there was a true emergency, and makes sure that the restraint was done properly and is recorded properly. And finally, our office serves to promote human rights by presenting forums and conferences, by producing a regular newsletter, attending meetings, and speaking out about the importance of human rights wherever we can so that people will be thinking about human rights and how to best support individuals whenever they're thinking about how they want to provide services. Solving human rights issues. What can a family do? Concerns about the quality of services. There may be instances in which services for your family member are just not satisfactory. Staff may not be attentive and respectful. The services might seem too restrictive. The services may not be sufficient to meet their needs. The provider may not be doing what was agreed to. Your family member deserves great services and you can advocate for them. Concerns about the service provider. If you are not satisfied with the way in which services are being provided, start with your service coordinator. Contact the provider agency management staff. They may not be fully aware of the program issues. Contact the area office. They fund the provider agency. They have a responsibility to make sure that the provider is doing what they are supposed to do. File a grievance with the provider agency's Human Rights Committee. You can access the committee through the provider's human rights officers or coordinator. Contact your regional DDS human rights specialist or the DDS director of human rights the Office for Human Rights can offer guidance and support for you. Concerns about the type of services. Use the individual support plan meeting to discuss the goals and challenges of your family member and the services that they need to succeed. You may want to advocate for additional services or a different provider. If you are not in agreement with the service plan, you have the right to appeal the ISP to the DDS Regional Director. You can request an ISP modification meeting if you don't want to wait until the next regular ISP meeting is scheduled. Reporting abuse and neglect. What to do if you suspect abuse or neglect by a caregiver? 
called the DPPC, Disabled Persons Protection Commission. It's a 24-hour hotline at 1-800-426-9009. The standard for reporting suspected abuse and neglect to the DPPC is reasonable cause to believe that abuse, neglect, or mistreatment was committed against a person with a disability. You do not need to be 100% sure. So when in doubt, make the call and let the investigators decide. Everyone who works with individuals with disabilities are mandated reporters. Non-mandated reporters can also call the DPPC. Outcomes. The provider is immediately notified of any allegations against its employees and is required to take all necessary immediate action to protect the alleged victim pending the outcome of the investigation. A written report of the investigation's outcome will be sent to individuals or their guardians upon request with instructions for appealing that outcome in case they do not agree with it. The guardian would have to call DPPC to find out when the investigation is completed in order to make this request. Hi, my name is Susan Nadworny. I'm the past chairperson of Massachusetts Families Organizing for Change and a parent. Mass Families Organizing for Change vision is one of empowerment for individuals and family support that includes planning, choices, and decision making. Our mission is to provide sustained advocacy and leadership training in pursuit of high quality, individualized community support and service options, including family support for people with disabilities and their families. One of our core messages is to imagine better. The possibilities are infinite for our loved ones. Mass Families Organizing for Change offers advocacy boot camp, leadership development, workshops, trainings, and conferences to parents, guardians, siblings, and caregivers to assist them in recognizing and advocating for quality services and supports. Historically, family members have been the driving force be behind policies and practices that promote dignity and better lives for individuals with disabilities. We inspire family members to encourage their loved ones to speak up and advocate for themselves. Every individual has the right to make decisions about their own life. Our family members deserve the best, and we need to do all we can to be informed. We at Mass Families Organizing for Change want parents, families, guardians to partner with schools, service agencies, and community organizations and all, all to advocate and assist our loved ones to live life to the fullest with positive supports that reflect their unique interests and desires with respect and dignity. We want all families to appreciate the human rights their family members have, that sometimes that means rocking the boat on behalf of them to stand up and speak up, not only for their safety, but for their quality, personalized supports for their lives. Making a positive impact and how you can help. Get involved. Get to know the provider and DDS staff that work with your family member. Communicate regularly and visit as often as you can. Help the provider to really know your family member. You are the expert on your family member. Help the staff to know about their preferences, interests, needs, and accomplishments. They are not just a service recipient, they are a person. Help your family member to celebrate their religious and cultural heritage. It's an important part of who they are. Speak up. You're a part of the service team. You have something to offer. If you see something you don't like, speak up. If you have an idea or suggestion, say it. If things are going well, let them know. This will encourage them to keep it up. The sky is the limit. Thank you for listening. We hope you found an, this informative. We've listed a number of resources for you to reflect on and call if you need them.